On behalf of the uh, Melbourne Law School and the Dean of the Law School, who apologizes for her absence, I'd like to welcome you to the 2012 uh, Sir Kenneth Bailey Lecture on International Law to be delivered by Professor Matthew Craven from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Um, I'd like to begin by just thanking two or three people who were very instrumental in getting this lecture going. Kiara, who's out there, um, played a major role. Kathy Hutton has been helping out, and uh, Marina Lone in the events office prepared some notes for me to read um, as I introduce Matt. So I'll draw on those liberally. Um, but I want to say something about Kenneth Bailey uh, first and also the Kenneth Bailey uh, lecture uh, briefly. Kenneth Bailey had one of those 20th century uh, public lives where he seemed to have been everywhere all at once. He was the dean of the law school. That's why we've named this lecture series after him. In fact, he was the dean twice between 1928 and 1942. He also held a professorship in public law and jurisprudence here. But in the uh, uh, other world, he was a representative for Australia at the League of Nations in the 1930s. And then probably his most prominent public role outside Australia was as a member of H.V. Evatt's delegation to the United Nations Conference in 1945 in San Francisco, where the Australians played a pretty major role in the development of the UN um, Charter. Um, subsequent to that, he became the uh, Solicitor General in Canberra, and then towards the end of his career, he was the High Commissioner for Australia in Canada before retiring. The lecture series was established in 1995. The first person to give the lecture was Gareth Evans. Uh, more recently, we've had B.S. Chimney and Marty Koskiniemi. So it's terrific that Professor Craven, henceforth Matt, has come from London to give the lecture. Matt is the Dean of Social Sciences and Arts at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He's also a professor of international law and a member of Matrix Chambers in London. He's also, most prominently, a, a, a senior fellow at the University of Melbourne Law School, where he's just finished delivering five days of seminars and lectures on statehood and resistance and colonialism. So Matt's scholarship, I think, falls into sort of three phases, um, at least my knowledge of it. Uh, I first came across Matt because he published a book at what seemed like a ridiculously young age on economic and social rights with Oxford University Press. So I sort of knew this book long before I knew Matt. In fact, we had a few, couple of phone calls before I actually met him for the first time. And he's still known in some circles as you know, Mr. Economic and Social Rights. But he's moved on from that. His second phase involved statehood. And I use quite a bit of his material when I teach that uh, part of the general international law course. In particular, an article he wrote on Macedonia and uh, Yugoslavia called What's in a Name, which was published in the Australian Yearbook of International Law several years ago. But Matt's late style has uh, been involved with the question of international law colonialism and empire. And it was part of that work that produced a book, The Decolonization of International Law, published two or three years ago, which is one of only two recipients in the history of Europe <laughs> to have won the European Society of International Law Prize for Book of the Year. So we're delighted that you're here to speak to us, Matt. <laughs> and thank you very much for coming. Well, thanks, Gary, for those um, extraordinarily kind words. Um, I'm obviously very pleased, but also very honored, almost humbled, to be invited here to deliver this lecture, um, particularly in light of the people who have delivered the lecture in the past. Um, so I think I ought to start with thanks. Thanks to the dean, Professor Carolyn Evans, Melbourne Law School, and to Gary for inviting me, enabling me to come amongst other things, to joy the stimulating intellectual environment in Melbourne. 
Um, but also the sun, actually. Although, having said that, apparently London's been experiencing a heat wave since I've gone. Snow's coming, just in time for me to go back. So, <laughs> um, I hope you might indulge me for a moment and allow me to begin my talk tonight in what seem, might seem to be a, a less than obvious place, given the title of my lecture. Having said that, I can see one or two of my students around in the, the hall today, and they may not be quite so surprised where I'm starting. In his book, uh, Discipline, Discipline and Punish, Michel Foucault reflects upon the fact that from its inception, in around 1840, the prison as an institution was immediately denounced as a failure. Far from reducing criminality, it was maintained, the prison was an engine for its generation, producing delinquency, impoverishing families, and encouraging recidivism. The reaction to these critiques, however, as Foucault was to observe, was always the same. The reactivation of new penitentiary techniques as the way of overcoming the perpetual failure of the old. Ooh, I think I've lost my sound. Can you still? Or is that better? The realization, as he put it, of the corrective pro project as the only method of overcoming the impossibility of implementing it. For Foucault, therefore, it was wrong to regard the prison as a failure. To the contrary, he asserted, not only had the carceral system succeeded extremely well in pathologizing the criminal subject, but the apparent failure of the prison was also precisely that which secured its own permanence. The prison survived as an institution not because it succeeded in reforming criminal subjects or because it provided an effective sanction to criminality, but precisely because it failed to do either of these things. The greater the volume of criminality, the greater the need for the penal institution. In the course of his account, he brings to prominence two ideas which I want to develop over the course of my talk tonight. The first is this idea of institutional failure, of the idea not merely that failure may, in a sense, be a necessary condition for the overall success of an institution, but that success and failure themselves are some ways entwined and a rationality that propels the institution forwards. In the second place is the associated idea that this institutional rationality takes the form of a system, in Foucault's case, a carceral system, that couples the institution of the prison with at least three other elements, an auxiliary penal knowledge, a sociology of rising criminality, and a utopian aspiration for reform. It's the connection between these two ideas, however, the connection between what one might call the efficacy of institutional failure on the one hand and its relationship to a systemic logic or rationality on the other that I want to bring to bear upon my analysis of the 1884-1885 Berlin Conference. So in very summary form, I want to try and do three things. In the first place, I want to develop an idea that had been hinted at some years ago by the historian Ronald Robinson, that the purpose of the Berlin Conference was not, as many had imagined, to manage or facilitate colonial expansion, but rather to forestall or prevent colonial rule by way of seeking to create within Central Africa an internationalized, non-sovereign space within which commercial extra commercial expansion and economic extraction could be undertaken under the banner of free commerce. Secondly, I want to suggest that the apparent failure of this regime, a failure marked in most bloody and violent manner through the infamous administration of King Leopold's Congo Free State, was one that emerged as a consequence of a particular logic which the re regime itself brought into play. Colonial rule was to appear, in a sense, as a consequence of its repression. In the third place, my argument is that the logic I'm trying to identify, which in my example takes the form of what I call a logic of extraction, is one that might be seen to operate in a wide variety of other fields and regimes. And the one particular example I'm going to come to at the end is the regime governing the deep sea bed. So, in other words, I'm trying to suggest that by 
reading various institutions and regimes in international law, whether it be, that be the regime of Berlin or the regime of the deep sea bed, or of the International Criminal Court perhaps, as being elements embraced within a systemic rationality possessing a dominant encoding logic, one is much better under, to, to understand what it is they do or what it is their effect, what their effect might be than if one was to concentrate merely upon the question of their apparent success or failure when read in their own terms. So, to begin with the Berlin Conference itself, I think the facts are well enough known. The conference had been convened by Bismarck with the assistance of the French Foreign Minister, Jules Ferry, in November 1884 at the height of imperial expansion into sub-Saharan Africa. That expansion had been stimulated, in part at least, by the recent arrival back to Europe of Henry Morton Stanley after his first successful trip across the African continent. But it was also apparent that it was, a pre it was proceeding in an increasingly dangerous and chaotic manner as new protectorates were being declared on an almost daily basis by rival colonial powers. The scramble for Africa as it had been dubbed by a Times columnist a few years earlier, was in full flood. So the overt purpose of the conference, of course, seemed to be to manage the ongoing process of colonization so as to avoid the outbreak of armed conflict. Its outcome was the conclusion uh, of a general act ratified by all major colonial powers, including the United States. Amongst other things, the general act set out conditions under which the territory might be acquired on the coast of Africa. It internationalized two rivers, the Congo and the Niger. It orchestrated a new campaign to abolish the overland trade in slaves and declared as neutral a vast swathe of Central Africa which was delimited at the conference and given the, given the name the conventional basin of the Congo. A side event, of course, was the recognition also given to Leopold's fledgling Congo Free State that had somewhat mysteriously emerged out of the scientific and th philanthropic activities of the International Association of the Congo. Now, if for lawyers and historians the facts of the, Congo, or of, the, sorry, of the conference are taken as a common starting point, this has not prevented widely divergent interpretations of its significance from emergence from emerging. On one side, one may find an array of international lawyers from John Westlake in the 19th century to Tony Angie in the 21st century affirming the importance of the conference and its general act for having created a legal and political framework for the subsequent partition of Africa. In Tony Angie's words, for example, Berlin transformed Africa into a conceptual terra nullius, silencing native resistance through the subordination of their claims to sovereignty and providing in the process an effective ideology of colonial rule. It was a conference, he argues, which determined in important ways the future of the continent and which continues to have a profound influence on the politics of contemporary Africa. On the other side, however, one may find more than a few historians who are largely dismissive of the legal significance of the conference. Sybil Crow for example, writing one of the early histories of the conference in 1943, was to suggest that the importance of the conference as a landmark in international law had been grossly exaggerated. Free trade, she writes, was to be established in the basin and the mouths of the Congo. There was to be free navigation on the Congo and the Niger. Actually, highly monopolistic systems of trade were set up in both these regions. The center of Africa was to be internationalized. It became Belgium. Lofty ideals and philanthropic intentions were loudly enunciated by delegates of every country to the conference, but yet only the vaguest and most unsatisfactory resolutions were passed concerning the slave trade, whilst the basin of the Congo became subsequently, as everyone knows, the scene of some of the worst brutalities in colonial history. Now, one may wonder whether at the outset whether Crow and Angie are actually talking about the same conference or indeed about the same agreement. For Crow, it's all about philanthropy, about the internationalization of the territory, about free trade. For Angie, all about colonialism, exploitation, the subordination of the natives. For Crow, its legal import was negligible. 
for Angie of considerable significance. And in a sense, one may be prompted to think that these differing interpretations force us into a choice. Was it a success? Was it a failure? Was it pro or was it anti-colonial? Did it or did it not forestall or facilitate subsequent partition? My contention, however, is that this is a false choice, that it was, in a sense, none of these things, or perhaps, alternatively, all of them simultaneously. Berlin was, perhaps, like Foucault's prison, both a failure and a success, both anti- and pro-colonial, both fostering partition and opposing it. And the key to these incompatible, or perhaps perverse, conjunctions being, however, the presence of the systemic logic, like, like Foucault's carceral system, enveloped both the internationalized regime itself and its subverted form. Colonization, to put it bluntly, arrived as a consequence of the internationalization of the territory, whose overt purpose was to prevent colonization taking place. So I need to take you through, I think, at this stage, the various steps of this argument. And I think to start, we need to turn back and briefly to the text of the General Act of the Berlin Conference itself. For those international lawyers who attribute to Berlin an important role in the subsequent partition of Africa, the key provisions of Articles 34 and 35 of the General Act. These articles require that colonial powers should establish effective authority over any territory to which they lay claim, and in doing so should notify other powers of any such claim. In themselves, of course, these provisions said nothing about the necessity of native consent, or indeed about the status of the 250-odd treaties that Stanley bragged about when he returned back from Africa. For many, however, it was hard to avoid the conclusion that African territory was effectively to be treated as terra nullius, open to colonization through regimes of effective administration and control. Indeed, for all the engaged international lawyers looking back at the events in Berlin during the period of decolonization, it was this more than anything else that stood out. Berlin, as Judge Amun was to put it in the Western Sahara case, was nothing other than a monstrous blunder, erasing the pre-colonial reality of native sovereignty. And Anne, in similar vein, was to complain of Berlin having contrived the unnatural division of Africa, ignoring in the process all ethnic tribal or national considerations. Umo Zarika, for his part, was simply to denounce Berlin for the immoral and inhuman and unjust law that it pervaded. If Berlin came to re represent for such lawyers a symbol of a degraded legality, it did so largely as a consequence of their attention to what it seemed to be its ideological content, what its terms seemed to suppress or leave unsaid as much as what it came to express itself. There was, after all, no mention of the notion of terra nullius either at the conference or indeed in the General Act. The terms of Articles 34 and 35 also seem to speak as much about the conditions underpinning the maintenance of claims to territory as as much the acquisition in the first place. This is not to say, of course, that the General Act didn't reflect a particular way of thinking about the non-European world or engender a rationality that made colonial rule not merely possible, but also positively desirable. But it does require a reading that looks some way beyond the text of the agreement itself. Now, if that's a common interpretation of the General Act, it's certainly not the only interpretation that one might find in the legal canon. Indeed, a very different account of the General Act is to be found in the separate opinions of Judges Schucking and Eisinger, in the, of the Permanent Court of International Justice in the Oscar Chin case of 1934. Now, in that case, the court had been asked to determine whether the financial aid that had been offered to a Belgian state-owned enterprise operating commercial shipping business along the Congo River violated the terms of the Treaty of Saint-Germain of 1919. Schucking and Eisinger disagreed not so much with the substance of the majority decision which was effectively to affirm the lawfulness of the Belgian government's acts. But they objected to the reliance upon the Treaty of Saint-Germain. It was not the Treaty of Saint-Germain that should have been the governing law, in their view, but rather the General Act of the Berlin Conference, which assumed the status, in their terms, 
of a statute or a constitution for Central Africa. What's interesting here is the conditions under which Eisinger and Schuching came to the view that the General Act assumed this constitutional aura. What drew their attention in that respect were not the provisions relating to the acquisition or maintenance of title to territory, but in fact all of the others. In their view, the General Act sought to institute for Central Africa a highly internationalized regime forged in the interests of peace and commerce. What they were referring to here were not only the provisions in internationalizing the Congo and Niger rivers, but the regime of neutrality and free commerce envisaged for the conventional basin of the Congo. On one side, as Schmidt was later to note with some horror, I believe, it was to create an amity line in reverse, preserving not war but peace beyond the line, providing a neutral domain in which commerce could operate without threat of war. On the other side, commerce would be organized along the principles of the open door. No import or export restrictions were to be permitted. No import or transit tariffs could be imposed on goods by those as fair compensation for expenditure. And all monopolies were to be prohibited, as were any commercial regulations of a discriminatory character. Now, to step back momentarily, the relationship between peace and commercial expansion that was articulated here seemed to speak rather ambivalently of the emergent role of high finance in European politics. For the early theorists of imperialism, Hobson, Lenin, Hilferding, the centralization of the economy through the banking system was the main feature of this new era of imperial expansion. It was this that was propelling the scramble. Yet, as Polanyi subsequently explained, it was also the cause for peace. If surplus capital within Europe was increasingly looking towards investment overseas, most overtly in railways, public utilities, ports, it was also typically affiliated with far too many different branches of business in far too many different countries at any one time for war to be regarded as a profitable endeavor. This, however, was to pose the question, how might economic expansion be achieved without disturbing the peace? How might peace be maintained if economic expansion normally took the form of com competitive colonization? And the answer to both of these questions seem to be found in the idea that Central Africa should be internationalized and that the colonizing impulses of the imperial powers should be constrained not by any outright prohibition, but rather by a regime whose purpose was to render colonization essentially futile or ineffective. Now, the key to this idea of internationalization was to be profound in the provisions of the General Act that circumscribed the ability of any colonial power from adducing revenue by way of tariffs or taxation. It was clear to begin with that any power assuming sovereignty over the Congo had to assume a range of obligations that were not otherwise incumbent of colonial powers elsewhere. In addition to the establishment of effective jurisdiction and committing themselves to improving the conditions of the moral and material well-being of the native population, they were also to assume primary responsibility for the pursuit of this new war on slavery, the war on the internal overland trade in slaves, for which the Arab traders were largely held responsible. If the responsibilities of the colonial rule in the Congo Basin were to be that much greater, so also was it clear that the benefits of establishing a colony or protectorate were to be that much less. In the first place, the prohibitions on monopolies and discriminatory commercial regulation meant that the usual benefits of colonial rule, namely the effective monopolization of commerce and trade, was ruled out. In the second place, it was also clear that the ability of the resident power to defray the administrative costs of colonial rule would be fatally undercut by the controls over the imposition of import and transit tariffs. This was to close off the most obvious source of public, public income. It being clear that no measure of general taxation would have sufficed as an alternative source of revenue given the relative small numbers of Europeans um, present in the Congo, and given the absence of a currency of any value. 
So in closing off the possibility of recuperating the costs of administering a colony in Central a Africa, let alone providing for the development of co commercial infrastructure, the regime seemed to decide, designed to achieve the objective of securing peace by the simple mechanism of ensuring that any colony would lack viability. Only, it might be said, the very brave or foolhardy would engage in colonization under such conditions. Just so happened, perhaps, that there was one such brave or foolhardy colonial power. If the success of the regime seemed to hinge ultimately upon it remaining an internationalized non-sovereign space, then the subsequent establishment of Leopold's Congo Free State across nearly the entirety of that space might, of course, be regarded as the principal feature of its failure. <coughs> Nevertheless, and this is the key to my argument, the apparent failure of the international regime was to, merely to reveal the presence of an underlying logic, the effect of which was to make its subversion entirely explicable. I'll just turn to Henry Morton Stanley. Stanley, who I mentioned earlier, had attended the conference as expert advisor attached to the American delegation as one of the only people really in the room at the conference who had any first-hand knowledge of the region. His advice was routinely sought out by all the delegations. And his advice was almost uniformly the same. What Central Africa needed was commerce. And what was needed for commerce to be extended was principally the infrastructure of commerce. Ports, warehouses, roads, railways, telegraph systems. Especially, as he advised, in order to traverse the cataracts which have hitherto formed an impenetrable barrier to the extension of the commerce up the river. In order to those, for those facilities to be created, however, investment would clearly have to be sought from European markets. And such investment would only be obtainable with security. Security both as to the physical integrity of the investment and as to the possibility of recuperating the costs through charges and levies on traded merchandise. That security, furthermore, could not be guaranteed through the usual mode of rule in non-sovereign space, i.e. extraterritorial jurisdiction, but would require the full armature of sovereignty, a system of police, a government, an administration, a system of civil and criminal justice. And together with these institutions, the development of an auxiliary knowledge, not only as the physical and human geography of the region, but also as to what it might have to offer for commercial markets in Europe. If, in other words, commercial expansion was to take place, it seemed it could only do so through the medium of the kind of control and surveillance provided by a European state. At this point, it thus becomes apparent that the appearance of Leopold's Congo Free State as the predominant power in Central Africa was not so much an expression of the failure of the internationalized regime, but in fact its most logical extension. Without it, commerce would have to rely upon the old systems of African middlemen to bring goods to and from the interior and forgo the possibility of any effective expansion. One might go further than this, in fact, and argue that the covert monopolies and exploitative practices of Leobold's administration that were to so outrage the other colonial powers and which led in turn to campaigns reform, and campaigns of reform in the hands of those such as Morel or Casement, were themselves an outgrowth of precisely the same regime. The very financial restrictions that were designed to dissuade the establishment of colonial rule did little other in the case of Leopold's free state than place a premium upon the ever more imaginative and violent extraction of wealth from the colony. The appropriation of land and the subscription of public labor under threat of punishment. This was not slavery, it was said. This was simply public service. In that sense, the demand for commercial freedom seemed to exhaust itself in the conditions for its own establishment in precisely the same way as the demand for internationalization of the Congo was subverted through the logic of its own ends. The old conundrum that had bedeviled historians of the era, whether trade followed the flag or vice versa, missed the essential point that in the case of the Congo, there really was no either or. 
only perhaps, to use Conroe's phrase, a rapacious and pitiless folly. What I've been trying to argue so far is not merely that we should reconsider the standard accounts of Berlin that seem to pervade the literature of international law, but that we might come to reflect in different ways about the apparent success or failure of a whole range of different institutional initiatives if, if we seek to understand them through the medium of the kind of systemic, systemic logic that I've been trying to describe here. One might ask in that sense as to the kind of logic that operates behind an institution such as the International Criminal Court, for example, whose success and failure is overtly organized in terms of the incidence and distribution of impunity, but whose function is also in part at least to generate that same knowledge. Similar questions might also be brought to bear upon the discussion of the role of regulatory agencies in the wake of the current banking crisis. Do they not always merely lay down the conditions under which the next catastrophe might take place? Is there not, in that case, still a systemic logic which is running through the process, which cannot be articulated simply in terms of the success or failure of their institutions? I'd like to conclude, though, by illustrating my argument with another relatively contemporaneous example that has quite deep parallels with my story about Berlin, that of the regime of the deep sea bed. On the face of it, the connection between these two regimes is not immediately obvious. The provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention relating to the deep sea bed, of course, were not about colonialism at all, but actually a reaction against everything it seemed to represent aligned to the objectives of the new international economic order and the declaration of permanent sovereignty over natural resources. It sought to immunize the resources of the deep sea bed against the appropriatory activities of companies of the industrialized world. The immediate background, as the early champion Arvid Pardo of Malta was to make clear, was found in the fear of either the enclosure of the deep sea bed through the increasingly exorbitant claims over the continental shelf, or through the straightforward appropriation of its mineral resources under the guise of freedom of the high seas by the private agencies of the industrialized powers. As he was to explain, the objective was to replace the laissez-faire system of freedom of the high seas with a non-discriminatory international system of management. This would make it possible that make possible the development of ocean space resources and the equitable sharing of the benefits derived therefrom for the benefit of all countries, with particular regard to the interests or needs of poor countries. If this were not done, the marine area beyond national jurisdiction would be used and exploited primarily by technologically advanced countries possessing the required financial resources. Working thus on the back of earlier General Assembly resolutions, the UN Convention, in its first incarnation, thus sought to operationalize the idea that the seabed and the ocean floor and its subsoil were the common heritage of mankind. They were to be protected from any claim or exercise of sovereignty on the part of any power, and its resources were, immunized, were to be immunized from appropriation on the part of any state or state, sub-state agency. Exploitation of the resources would be undertaken, as it was originally imagined, in the name of and for the benefit of the international community as a whole. This would be undertaken by an instrumentality called the Enterprise, which would oversee the transfer of resources and of technology to the developing world. <coughs> in the same way as Berlin, thus, what the authors had in mind was the creation of an internationalized space within which commercial extraction might take place in conditions of peace. What needed to be resisted was the possibility of the monopolization of that space. But precisely like Berlin, the same dilemmas to affect this regime. How to accrue an effective geographic knowledge of the deep sea bed, of the resources that were contained therein, or indeed to organize the extraction of those resources without in the process being seen to authorize or assign sovereignty to one or more states. And of course, the same logic comes into play. Putting a productive regime of extraction in place would require not merely financial resources and access to the necessary effective extractive technology, but it would also involve or require plant, storage, distribution systems, facilities for transshipment and sale, 
even if the enterprise were to seek to undertake these activities, not only would it first have to acquire the resources and technology to undertake the work and develop perhaps an armature of police to, to guarantee the integrity of those investments, but even once in operation, it would still have to rely upon the intermediation of other agencies, whether states or their companies, in order to bring those resources to market. So one encounters an almost inevitable unraveling of the original vision in subsequent negotiations and the conclusion of a new agreement in 1994, allowing now for the joint exploration through the combined activities of the International Seabed Authority and pioneer investors. No transfer of technology, no pooling of resources in the hands of the Seabed Authority, no subsidization of the activities of the enterprise. It introduces, as one commentary was to put it, a functional and cost-effective approach to the establishment of the institutions, providing a stable environment for investors in deep-sea minerals under a market-oriented regime, guaranteeing access to all qualified investors. In the process, of course, it envisages that the seabed will be effectively allocated to the pioneers who whilst not enjoying exactly the rights of sovereignty, are nevertheless in a position to enjoy exclusive rights to graze their mining companies on the common soil of the deep sea bed, under condition only that a levy be paid to the seabed authority. Whether, in fact, that levy will ever do anything more than simply recompense the land-based producers of these resources, manganese, nickel, cadmium, for the damage inflicted upon their economies by the introduction of new supplies of these materials remains to be seen. Is this, one may ask, what authors of the common heritage had in mind? In a sense, of course, one may say it was not. But at the same time, as soon as it came to be articulated, as soon as the idea of the common heritage came to be articulated in terms of the equitable distribution of the surplus value of extraction, it unleashed a certain logic. The deep sea bed was a resource, a commodity, something to be mined and extracted, traded and sold. And the means of doing so was ultimately through the allocation of individual rights over those resources to someone somewhere in some place. The real irony, of course, being the language under which this has taken place the language, as I said, of the common heritage, and the way in which this threatens to play out or enact precisely what Hardin called so many years ago as the tragedy of the commons. What he meant by this was not the mere fact of historical enclosure, but rather the permanent and irreversible stripping out of the material of, from the common environment, an unsustainable process of extraction and accumulation. The pleasure falls to me um, because you've performed in such a timely manner to actually take some questions before offering the vote of thanks. But I just wanted to um, say, sorry, if I'm peering at you, it's because the lens just popped out of my glasses. So <laughs> I've only got one glass. One eye. Yeah, one eye. Um, but I think it's really interesting that, you know, we take for granted so much this idea that Gary Simpson once observed about international law having become um, the kind of most popular secular language in which the claims to justice are expressed. And I think it was very salutary to listen to Matt's lecture to remind us that international law, whether or not we think of it as a language for the struggle of good against evil, is also a practice of knowledge generation and institution building. Um, which is very important. It reminds me of something that uh, James Crawford said recently, which was that you don't have to believe in God to know that the clergy exists. So it's the idea that the thing that's going on with international law is not the relationship to the stated aims, but that it's a practice of knowledge generation and institution building. And I think your lecture was fantastic at drawing out um, the dangers of falling into the trap of the laws of unintended consequences if you don't pay attention to the historical context in which the logics underlying international law have arisen and the way in which at moments of ostensible failure 
those logics become most apparent. So that the way that those are moments of both and not either or was very well drawn as you took us from Berlin to the deep sea bed. Okay, a few questions. Kevin. Um, Because you very consciously analogize or use Foucault's logics, or your own logic. I want to ask you about one of the kind of criticisms of him, which is the role of agency in all of these logics. And he's criticized for saying, well, the reformers had agency. They wanted to create a carceral system that actually did reform people, but then completely unconsciously behind the backs of men, the unintended delinquency produced by the carceral system articulated with other social interests, and that's why it kept going. So I, I'm just curious in terms of the aspects I don't know about, which what you were presenting tonight, where does agency fit into it? Were there self-conscious attempts to exploit the failure of this internationalized space in order to create a more productive, extractive regime? Or really was it a more functional kind of explanation where nobody consciously thought about it, but because it worked, it continued to persist and allow the, you know, the, the, the transformation to occur? I, yes, I was, I, yeah, I mean, I can see, see where you're coming from with, with Foucault there, and as you said, that's a common starting point, the, the, the absence of agency, and partly because agency is produced through the discourses and knowledge production that, that he's talking about. So, so part and parcel of what he's trying to describe is the process by which subjects are constituted. And that in some ways feeds through very directly in, into the, the language of colonial subjectivity about the way in which, in a sense, the, 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 the modes of colonial rule formed in a sense the colonized identities for the colonized subjects. That's not to say, though, that, that one can't imagine places or spaces in which resistance might lodge itself. Um, I think the point he's trying to, trying to activate or trying to bring to bear is that in some ways, if you're opposing a system or an institution or opposing a particular process in its own terms, so this is where the idea of system and, and, and success and failure comes in. So if you oppose it in its own terms, more often than not, all you're doing is reaffirming, in a sense, the essential dynamics of that which you are opposing. So you need to be able to, in a sense, try to stand outside it, oppose. And I suppose the, the, the easiest example is about the common heritage. So the idea of institutioning or declaring the deep sea bed as the common heritage of mankind is perhaps perfect, yeah, great idea. So this is what needs to be done. The problem, though, was the way in which it was articulated. The problem, though, they were, was the, that they were articulating still in the terms of a resource. So they imagined it was a resource which then could be in some ways extracted and distributed in a equitable way, but of course brought in its wake a certain logic. That of course is to pose the question, well maybe there was another way in which one could go about describing the common heritage, a way, another way of thinking about the common heritage that would have not led to the perpetuation or the, 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 the in a sense, the, the generation of that particular kind of extractive logic playing out in the way it clearly did in subsequent negotiations. Um, my Submission is that um, I don't find interna I, I find that international law has no contribution to the logic of extraction in the situation in many countries in Africa today. For example, if you look at the situation in Rwanda, the genocide in Rwanda, you see that what transpired prior to the genocide was rooted in the Berlin Conference. And because of the colonization policies of divide and rule, they divided the ethnic groups in Rwanda, which eventually led to the genocide. Now, when the genocide was, when the genocide was happening, you could see that international law played no significant role to prevent the bad things that happened during the genocide. Yet international law has principles which, when you look closely at those principles, you begin to imagine that all oh, these are really good principles which can prevent such happenings. So I don't see the relevance of international law. It, they're just principles which have no effect in countries 
that were subjected to the bad things in the Berlin Conference. Uh, what I is your comment on this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Can I take that, the next? I'll take three and then give Matt the chance to respond. Sorry, I don't know your name in the white shirt. Uh, okay, yeah, I just, I guess it's along the similar vein. Um, the way the Berlin Conference to me, it looks like just a very thin veil of uh, unjust exploitation. And I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Is that the way, correct way of characterizing it? Matt, thanks very much. My name is Ryan Rosara. I enjoyed it. Uh, Matt, can I just ask you about the claims to the competing claims to the Arctic shelf? Is that also a similar type of problem <laughs> like that? I, you know, you've got a limited number of countries that can actually um, make claims to that, but is it a s similar sort of logic of extraction issue? And how can we uh, remedy that, you know, in the... Do you want to respond to those three now? Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to those three. So, so the first two, uh, I suppose the first question, I wasn't quite sure. I, I understand the story about you know, international law has, doesn't seem to have, has all sorts of promise in terms of regulation of violent prevent, preventing genocide, but doesn't seem to deliver. But I wasn't quite sure how that was related to your understanding or the way in which you wanted to talk about Berlin. So it seemed to be the say, case that you wanted to say that Berlin <coughs> did partition, and that was the consequence of Berlin. So international law had this ability to effectively partition Africa and, in, in the form that, that, that we came to understand it in the, in, the, in the 20th century. But yet, after that, it, it lost its ability to have any purchase on delivering justice. So it was an you know, engine for the delivering of perhaps injustice, but not the converse. My, my argument is not that the Berlin Conference didn't ultimately, in a sense, lead in some fairly logical process or, 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 or uh, provide, in a sense, the, 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 the momentum for the subsequent partition. So uh, I'm not denying that. All I'm saying, in some ways, it, it happened in a very different way. So it didn't happen because in Berlin, they were drawing the lines and they were saying, these are the, these are the, this is how, in a sense, Africa should be de delimited. I'm saying, actually, it perversely happened through the internationalization of the Central Africa. So if you say that Berlin was about internationalizing Central Africa and then say, well, how on earth did it happen after that, that it came to be partitioned? Well, the reason for that is because the logic that was operationalized in Berlin, which was an extractive, exploitative logic, worked through in that way. So yes, it was a consequence, but it's not a causal or an effect, you know, a, a, a straightforward, this is what the conference said, and this is, uh, the, the result was or was not the consequence of the conference, or, or, or of the terms of the General Act. I'm saying that, in a sense, one needs to understand the effects being operated in a, in some ways, a much more indirect way, that these things bring things to bear, bring certain logics to bear, induce people to do certain things in certain ways, and that's how it happened. Um, and I think in some ways you can say the same, you can start inquiring in the same way about, in a sense, all of the institutions you were talking about, the UN and all the other agencies who are supposed to be, in a sense, preventing genocide. Again, one may question, well, if you see them or think about them in simply in terms of do they do what they say on the can or do they not, then you're blinding yourself to, in a sense, the question in some ways that's set up there, the question that starts at the origination. So what is it or why is it that we imagine that these institutions should be doing this? Why is it we imagine and what happens when we imagine the existence of a UN which has the ability apparently to prevent conflict prevent genocide or whatever else. So, in some ways, it's a questioning of how one understands or how one engages with the evaluative process of deciding whether something is good or bad. And I'm, what I'm trying to say is that's not simply in terms of what, how the institutions describe themselves. So the Arctic. Um, I'm afraid I, I really very, know very little about I mean, I know, obviously, the, the, the newspaper story. But my hunch is, yes, this is exactly the same process. It's, you know, it's, it's about resources. It's about claiming those resources, about access to the material and uh, 
the deep sea bed or that might be located there. Whether there's oil, I don't know, but it will enact the same sort of process. You'll need, in a sense, the technology both to for under, underwater exploration and for subsequent extraction. You've got no doubt that there are it's not going to be happen through public agencies. It's not going to happen through international agencies. It's going to be operated through a consortium of private companies. That's, yes, I'm afraid I think it's just the same thing. Although you don't have, in a sense, the language of common heritage operating as a, as a cover for that to happen. Last question from Margaret. Do you need, do you need a microphone or are you okay? I think I'm okay. Okay. Um, can people hear? Oh, you need it for the recording. The technology drives all form here. Okay, I have a, um, a comment and a question, and they may be related. I'm not sure yet. You'll be able to tell, perhaps. Um, and it refers to um, your reference to the tragedy of the commons mm. in the conclusion of your piece. Um, and it reminded me of Eleanor Ostrom's uh, analysis um, of how tragedies can be averted or have been averted in various contexts, um, mainly through monitoring, so the um, participation of, of various groups um, who are able to monitor their own resources. And this may or may not be happening in the deep sea bed. Um, the implication is that it, it is not, and that has to do with those institutions that you've already mentioned. But a major difference, it seems, between the deep sea bed and Africa is that people live in Africa. The deep sea bed is uninhabitable and completely alien to human life and experience. So I wonder if uh, that still suits your analogy given that the people living in Africa were disempowered and not able to exert that monitoring role over what you are suggesting is a commons type scenario. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure how well they're connected. Um, I'd have to think about the connection between the two. Um, yes, I can see, obviously, there's a contrast there between, between Africa and the deep, deep sea bed. And, 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 of course, in some ways, that may argue, so far as one can identify the logic working in the same way in both places, one can argue, well, actually, that's simply a... Um, a reflection of, upon the mentality of the, 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 the um, participants of the Berlin, which was really to, to understand Africa as, as a vacant space. It was a, a space within which one could undertake, com uh, 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 put in place a regime for extraction. Um, I'm not sure whether the presence of the people necessarily changed it, though. I, I mean, I think, I think one can also understand Berlin and the logic of extraction working through the existence of the po population. And one, one of the, the famous delegates, or the delegates who is famous insofar as he's, he, he was seen to be the, the liberal within, within the Berlin Conference, talked about the necessity for the extension of commerce as, as being not simply in terms of the extraction, the stripping out of resources, but also in terms of bringing the population in. So we need to actually make the Africans into not only producers of things that we want, but also consumers. So it's the generation of, in a sense, the colonial subject as both producer and consumer, um, which in some ways is simply an extension of that same logic. Again, one was working through, one needed to colonize, and the process of colonization was the process by which you could then produce the colonial subject as a consumer of Western goods and as a producer of the primary goods that could be exported back to, 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 to Europe. So I'm not sure that their presence would have fatally undermined the, in a sense, the process of logic. I think it would take you, you know, you could develop that argument and say, well, actually, that feeds straight through into the, the, you know, the logic of the, the developmental state in the 20th century. This is where it starts, so this is the point at which that idea is generated. But I'm not sure it fundamentally changes it. I mean, I, th I suppose I'm ambivalent about this idea of monitoring, because in some ways, and one of the important things here was about the, the, the form of knowledge that was being generated. And this was so clear when... Um, when one looks at the work of, 
Stanley in the way Stanley understood the knowledge that he was coming back with. So he came back with these volumes and he published his diaries every time he went on a trip. And they're full of sketches and pictures but, and description of plants and animals and resources. But embedded within that is also a description about what you did with it. And it's routinely all the way through his description, you know, neutral descriptions of the geology and the flora and fauna and biology of Africa is what you can do with these things. So it was also about describing you know, indigenous technologies for the extraction of these various different reasons, what you do with the roots and barks and stuff like that. That was what was coming back. And so I'm very ambivalent about the idea that one, you know, this idea of surveillance or knowledge generation is something which is in its own right a sort of a neutral or, a, or an emancipatory process because I think it, it potentially has embedded within it all sorts of problematic ideas about what it is we're generating the knowledge for. So what is the instrumentality that operates behind the knowledge de generation? At that point, it's good always to leave people wanting more. So I'm going to draw the proceedings to a close and simply say thank you very much, Matt. Um, it was a great pleasure. That's a gift from the oh, school. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. Um, and thank you for a lovely, informative lecture.